morning. Good morning, sir. Good evening, sir. Hi guys, how's how's everybody? Good to see you here. Can you all hear me? Uh, can we unmute uh, Amjad, David, please? Good morning. And how are you? I'm good. Sorry, David. There was confusion about the timing. I really apologize that. Uh, no what problem. what time is it there at the moment? Uh, Six a.m. So. Yeah, I'm sorry. This was scheduled for eight according to your time. I had it there as well, but somehow it, the time changed and I didn't know. I apologize. Yeah, just um, I may have a, a phone call come in at 630. I'll hang up with them and reschedule, but I'm um, sorry for the rudeness of my during my talk. You know, we really apologize for this. Um, um, somehow the time changed. And I don't know what happened. We'll have to check that. Um, the the host today is Nadim. Let's see if he's in the moderator today. Uh, we had to change uh, the second talk as um, uh, Hassan Sayed was from Virginia. Uh, he had a case and so he had to re reschedule. And uh, so Amjad Shad is very kind. He's a consultant uh, neurosurgeon from Coventry in UK who will be um, talking about an adult uh, uh, discussion how to follow this. Um, I had requested two, I had actually asked Adrian from Puerto Rico to uh, join us and he called half an hour after I just said yes, so, but I, we said we'll do him uh, separately. Maybe we're doing an epilepsy talk with you and do it right on the right time, maybe in fortnight time. Yeah, no problem, uh, we just have to work out the times. So I'm happy to do talks on epilepsy and other things as well. Okay, I think we, we would uh, start because this is now um, a few seconds to go, 10 seconds to go. So it's really uh, my pleasure um, to have Amjad and uh, um, David both here, uh, both our dear friends and uh, they, they have worked really hard for education all along. Uh, Amjad, uh, are, are you there? Please, uh, Amjad, are you there? Internet ko kya hua? Okay, are you okay, Amjad? Is your net working? I think he's in Coventry. Yeah, there. The net problems the last time as well. Let's he hope that it doesn't. <laughs> Okay, I, th I think we, we're going to start. Uh, it's really my pleasure to um, uh, have with us distinguished guests. We have uh, uh, Professor David Adelson. Uh, he's from US. He's actually the committee chair for uh, World Federation of Neurological Societies, Neurosurgical Societies. He's uh, 
really the driving force behind all of us working really hard and uh, education all along. Uh, and it's uh, really our pleasure and we're honored to have him here with us. Uh, David, please, uh, he's going to be talking about uh, his uh, favorite subjects, uh, which is the um, uh, tumors of um, pediatric population. Thank you, David. Well, thank you, Salman. I appreciate it. It's uh, wonderful to be here. Um, I think that I just need to uh, share my screen. Um, uh, Meg, can you please allow uh, David to share the screen? Hey, he's the co-host. Okay, yeah, so you can, you can, okay, so you yeah. can. Go to this here, share, and then. Yeah, it says on the bottom, yeah, that's fine. No worries, I'm just. Uh, I'm gonna, there you are. Just going to, from the beginning, just, do you see that okay? Yeah, we see it all right, yeah, perfect. All right, give me one second, let me. Uh, just uh, share the other screen. I think that would be uh, better. Okay. Does that see, you see the, my arrow in the screen okay? Yeah, much better. Brilliant. Okay, thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Well, good evening to you. Uh, it's early morning for me. I uh, uh, got a little surprised on the time, so I forgot my tie. So uh, um, we'll have to uh, work on that later. Uh, but anyway, um, uh, welcome. I'm going to speak today a little bit on the basics of uh, pediatric uh, brain tumors. I think uh, uh, what we do with regards to the diagnosis and then ultimately what we do um, for uh, treatment uh, with different tumors. Uh, pediatric brain tumors have evolved a lot in our management and our diagnosis and uh, I think this is an exciting time for anybody uh, who um, uh, is interested in this uh, field. Um, there we go. Um, I have no disclosures. Um, just as an introduction, uh, pediatric brain tumors are the second most common uh, childhood malignancy. So um, uh, clearly if uh, one is interested in pediatric, then uh, pediatric brain tumors uh, uh, will keep you busy. Um, it's the most common uh, solid neoplasm uh, with an estimated uh, 2,500 to 3,500 new diagnoses each year. And what's been great about being in the field as, as long as I have is that uh, there's been survival, uh, improved survival that have really, uh, has really flipped. Um, when I started um, medulloblastomas, there was only a 20% uh, survival at five years. Uh, with an 80% mortality within that time. Um, and now it's uh, closer to 80% survival uh, with only about a 20% mortality. So clearly uh, we've made advances uh, in these areas. But still, despite all these advances, it still remains the leading cause of cancer death in childhood and accounting for about 25% of all um, uh, pediatric uh, cancer deaths. So. What has really been the, uh, the impact of brain tumors? I, I, I know for this audience, it's, it's pretty, uh, uh, pretty obvious uh, that um, with brain tumors, many of these children, and you can see the percentages based on the literature that will have permanent neurocognitive uh, problems. So uh, some sort of uh, functional differences um, in all of these children. And it's also not just the, and we have to take into account, it's not just the, the brain tumor itself, but it's also the treatment that we give and the different modalities of treatment that will lead to these different problems. So we may be able to take out a, a tumor in a right frontal lobe and, and the child be you know, absolutely perfect neurologically, uh, but if it's um, on a, a high grade tumor that requires radiation and chemotherapy, that radiation and chemotherapy will clearly have a potential impact on, um, on the brain and, and particularly on the developing brain. So one needs to take that into account when dealing with children. Um, about, uh, about 50% will uh, develop. We could mute that, that would be great. Um, uh, and so, you know, again, um, these are 
uh, issues that we often need to uh, deal with with regards to these children. I do a lot of epilepsy surgery and many of these uh, children um, have uh, tumors uh, that were the origin of their epilepsy and um, and so uh, it's one to need to take into account. And then uh, obviously just the brain tumor diagnosis alone has a significant impact on the family, uh, on the juggling because of the intensity of the therapy that these uh, children need to undergo. This impacts um, the job and, and then often other siblings, you know, with uh, the stress within the family. And then clearly we know that in order to improve these different things, we really need to take a much more individualized, more personalized approach uh, toward the management of these children. Do we really need to give, you know, this um, really wide and extensive chemotherapy when a more targeted approach would be better? Because in those instances, would we be able to uh, improve the sort of the long-term neurocognitive issues that uh, many of these children suffer. So again, when you, you'll see through my uh, presentation, the evolution of where we've gone, particularly, and I'll use pediatric brain tumors, but this is true across the whole spectrum of uh, uh, brain cancer uh, in our field. So across the whole uh, age gamut from early childhood to the uh, older adult. So this is just um, a standard kind of, uh, what are the more common histology uh, by age? Um, one can see in the early um, children, the embryonal tumors with uh, medulloblastoma, with obviously a pilocytic gastrocytoma uh, being uh, uh, the second most common. As we get into the uh, older children, the, the uh, the number of cases, uh, uh, most common histology is uh, pilocytic gastrocytoma. And then in some series, uh, as you get to the older teenagers, these sort of midline tumors could be uh, pituitary, but then um, astrocytomas also uh, tend to uh, be still a, a significant number. And then you can see the evolution uh, as um, you look into, uh, as you get into adulthood. Now, having said that, in all honesty, um, um, it's, it's often very much how patients are directed. And so I haven't seen too many uh, pediatric uh, uh, pituitary tumors. Many times these cases get taken care of in the community and not necessarily referred uh, for management uh, in our, to our center. So what are the standard ways that we do diagnosis? Um, usually it's simply the, the uh, ways that we would evaluate any patient that we see for the first time. Uh, the signs and symptoms are often relative specifically to their location. Patients can present with seizures. Um, and so uh, this is, seems to be one of the more common things that uh, we've encountered with regards to, um, uh, to seeing these patients. Uh, they can develop uh, headaches due to obstruction of CSF outflow. A lot of times if there's obstruction of the fourth ventricle or the aqueduct, then in those patients, uh, they'll have um, elevated ICP, maybe altered consciousness, those kinds of things. Focal neurologic deficits, as you, as you would imagine, depending on location. Um, in some instances, meningismus, uh, or, and then lastly, as I mentioned, with regards to pituitary tumors, and if you had tumors in the supracellar region, uh, let's say like optic gliomas or craniopharyngiomas, uh, they'll often uh, present with um, uh, endocrine dysfunction as well. Maybe short stature, maybe difficulties with DI, uh, diabetes insipidus, and those kinds of things. So simply, um, it's what we do for all patients uh, where we suspect neurological disease. You know, clearly the history and physical exam uh, remains the mainstay for us to get baseline understanding of how that patient is doing. Uh, imaging uh, with and without um, uh, contrast um, uh, agents uh, is necessary to, have to uh, better highlight the uh, tumors. Um, for different um, uh, diagnoses, uh, we, will, we would like to get uh, cerebral spinal fluid uh, in order to do the staging. 
Um, other types of imaging modalities um, exist as well. And, um, and I think that there'll be more in the future, which will help us, especially as we identify the uh, specific markers for each of these tumors, uh, we will be able to come up with better ligands to, uh, to target these tumors. The, the big mainstay is, is clearly surgery for tissue diagnosis and whether it's a biopsy or uh, uh, you know, complete removal of the tumor. Uh, this is uh, now our, our um, uh, you know, uh, primary area for ultimate diagnosis and evaluation. And then uh, as you'll see later, you know, the, the growth of our, our ability to look at uh, targeting these tumors, whether it be with germ cell markers or molecular markers, I think that's really where the future lies and uh, where I think we're going to have our most impact on individualizing and personalizing um, uh, these surgeries. Um, here, for example, just with regards to functional imaging and PET, here's a FDG PET. Looks pretty nonspecific. Maybe, maybe you've got some increased uh, glucose here, um, uh, uh, but this is a C11 methionine, and one can appreciate the difference uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this particular patient. Um, immunohistochemistry um, has been around now for a while, and it's really the mainstay when we do histologic diagnosis. Uh, being able to uh, see these and to uh, be able to develop this battery, I'm sorry, I'm going to move this out of the way, um, uh, is uh, one way that we can um, really start to identify the, the tumor types and uh, uh, those um, uh, specific tumors so that we can apply appropriate uh, treatment and management. Now, the classification of tumors uh, really depend on at this time, uh, not just the um, histologic markers, but now uh, with uh, the growth of um, these, let's say, germ cell markers and molecular markers, I think that this very, how should I say, very general um, classification will become even that much more targeted, um, especially as um, uh, we grow to understand uh, the origins and the unique aspects of uh, of these pediatric uh, brain tumors. So just to go over the types and locations, uh, this is just a comparison between adults and children, the different types of tumors, as I showed uh, earlier, um, but also their location, as you have uh, pr uh, probably heard uh, to, to date. Um, most often uh, in the pediatric population, we deal with infratentorial tumors as compared to adult tumors, uh, where um, it's much more common to have supertentorial um, origin for their tumors. Interestingly, in infants, it's uh, fairly 50-50. So um, pretty even infra and supertentorial. It's not in really until we get to uh, more of the toddler age range where we start to see the, the real uh, increase in percentage of patients with uh, infratentorial tumors. Um, interestingly enough, I do do um, adult uh, brain tumors, um, particularly if they're in the uh, infratentorial space. Um, and that's really because sometimes we've seen um, uh, young adults, um, 20, 25 with, let's say a medulloblastoma where uh, inadequate uh, tumor removal uh, was done. And so in those instances, we would want to go back and get more tumor to really lighten and decrease the tumor burden for those patients. Um, and again, uh, uh, in a lot of ways from the uh, intraparenchymal uh, tumors, the uh, pediatric neurosurgeon has gets a lot of experience in this area. And this is a, a very common area for, for us to uh, be dealing with uh, these uh, tumors. Um, some of the supertentorial tumors that we'll see both in adults and children um, really run the gamut. And uh, uh, I know you're familiar with these, but you know clearly uh, astrocytic origin is is the more common. Uh, but you know again, frequently we see 
tumors like craniopharyngioma, midline tumors like germinoma, particularly in teenage males, uh, choroid plexus tumors, and then unfortunately ATRT. Uh, similarly, with the infratentorial tumors, the big three, uh, astrocytoma, medulloblastoma, and ependymoma. Um, rarely uh, we get uh, some of these other tumors, uh, but they, they do occur, um, and particularly um, DIPG or diffuse intrinsic brainstem tumors are particularly concerning to us because of the, um, the poor long-term prognosis. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, because um, they can more often present with obstruction of um, CSF outflow, um, many times uh, the symptoms we see in these children initially are nausea, vomiting, headache, um, sometimes ataxia or some uh, cranial nerve uh, dysfunction. Cerebellar astrocytomas um, occur, uh, account for approximately 20% of all the brain tumors in children. Uh, peak incidence is usually in the first decade. So a typical case would be a child who comes in ataxic, intermittent headache, starts to develop vomiting for a week, all of a sudden, uh, they finally get a scan. One can see papilledema in these kids. Um, gender is fairly equal, and you can see on this picture, very typical uh, scan view with contrast-enhancing mural nodule with a surrounding cyst. Um, sort of our rule of thumb is if you uh, see a large cyst in the posterior fossa, most likely it's uh, uh, with a tumor. Um, it most likely is a, uh, uh, a juvenile polycytic uh, astrocytoma. Here's just some of the imaging studies, uh, CT scan. Um, the the uh, lesions uh, tend to be uh, hypodense prior to IV contrast. Uh, you can see a fair amount of enhancement uh, in this particular tumor uh, surrounding the wall. Um, they're usually hemispheric, though they can be uh, midline, uh, they can be right up to the cerebellar pontine angle um, in these instances. Uh, but just to be careful is that they're not always cystic. So they can be uh, solid tumors and sometimes there can be some confusion as to that. Um, and again, um, and then they can also have a, a fair amount of uh, mixed uh, signal. Um, here's just some other imaging characteristics that you would see on uh, MRI. And again, you can see this uh, very typical mural nodule with a large cyst, uh, solid tumor. This turned out to be a JPA as well. And then this uh, very mixed picture. So again, um, don't be fooled just based on the uh, imaging. That's why tissue diagnosis uh, remains the mainstay. With regards to treatment, um, particularly for cerebellar astrocytomas, it is an, uh, a paradigm that it is a surgical disease. So the goal is a gross total uh, complete resection of the tumor. If the tumor recurs or there's residual, um, at this time, repeat surgery to ensure a gross total resection uh, is, um, is indicated. Now, we know that it can be curative with a complete resection. So part of what we try to accomplish um, is that. Um, I think now uh, there are some opportunities if there's small residual um, and one, if a child was fairly fragile or if there were some concern about having to go back and try to locate a tumor that may be more difficult to um, uh, locate either um, visually or just location-wise, it was an area that you didn't feel that you could get into safely without causing further injury or damage. Um, there is the use of potential uh, for laser ablation. And again, uh, that's an advanced technology. Um, it's not routinely used, uh, but we've used it in a couple of cases of tumor recurrence uh, with good results to date. Um, again, there's always the, the, the controversy, should you um, remove the, nod, um, the wall of the tumor? It sort of depends if it's a very thin rim of, of enhancement, we tend not to uh, remove the wall. 
if it was like that mixed picture that I showed, which were very thick and it looks and, and is obviously tumor, then we tend to um, uh, remove uh, that wall as well. Um, there's no indication for radiation at this time for uh, um, cerebellar astrocytomas. Got a little bit of a freeze, there we go. Um, moving on to medulloblastomas, it's uh, the most common malignant neoplasm in the CNS. Um, 15 to 20% of uh, childhood brain tumors, a peak incidence between three and eight years of age, slight male predominance. Biological behavior um, is, is really quite varied. 40% um, infiltrate the brainstem. There's often CSF dissemination, which is the reason for the lumbar puncture for um, staging of these uh, patients. Um, uh, there's in the literature this 10% systemic metastasis. In all honesty, I've never seen it. Uh, I have seen it only in patients uh, with very diffuse disease where we've placed a ventricular peritoneal shunt, um, and then we've seen secondary metastasis do, uh, due to that. Um, so I, I would not say that this is a common and, and uh, not one that we would routinely see. These were sort of the basic criteria of where we just defined risk. And so when, looks, when one looks at a medullo, um, you know, low risk versus high risk, um, you know, it's, it was based on age, um, the amount of residual tumor. Um, and again, this is where volume of tumor uh, was very, uh, where volume of tumor was very important um, as in these uh, patients in order for us to uh, be able to get the best diagnosis. And then of course, question of, uh, of metastasis, particularly along the uh, rest of the CNS system. Um, with regards to imaging, uh, this is uh, typically what we'd see on CT, hyperdense lesion um, here that's fairly solid, but it also would tend to have a heterogeneous enhancement. The rule of thumb that we would use with regards to the initial CT scan is that if it's hyperdense on CT, it's more likely a medulloblastoma. If it's hypodense on CT, it's more likely to be a cerebellar astrocytoma. Reasoning being is that you've got very highly dense, tightly packed cells uh, in the uh, malignant um, a high grade tumor versus the cerebellar astrocytoma often has cysts. So on CT scan, um, more likely to be low density uh, in that area. Uh, they tend to be uh, midline, uh, vermian and lower in origin. Uh, due to their uh, origin, uh, cell origin as well. Um, they can be hemispheric and in the angle, um, rarely in the brainstem. I have not seen it, but it is in the literature. Um, and it can be in the uh, supertentorial space as well. Uh, here's the typical imaging uh, you'd see on uh, MRI, uh, heterogeneous mass in the midline, obstructing CSF, causing uh, hydrocephalus. You can see the lateral ventricles, large foramen of Monroe, third ventricle, and then really obstruction at the level of uh, up to the uh, aqueduct in this case. And then um, as well, they can be off laterally and you can see here tumor up against the tentorium. But again, um, fairly um, typical look on imaging on these pictures, uh, but they can be quite varied in, in uh, other uh, other patients. And so don't be sold on what it is based on the uh, imaging. Uh, we love to play our game on with, uh, with residents and trainees and people in the room as to what do they predict that this tumor will be. And then uh, we have the uh, arbiter being the neuropathologist. With regards to um, medulloblastoma, if you suspect, um, in our case, it's if there's uh, posterior fossa tumor, we tend to get preoperative spinal imaging as well, and one can appreciate uh, that there can be uh, distant metastases uh, in these patients. Similarly, they can have, they can often present with leptomeningeal disease, and uh, obviously in these cases, uh, this is a very sad um, a prognosis uh, when they've got such disseminated uh, disease. 
Um, with regards to um, the uh, imaging, as I mentioned, here's a typical tumor. Our goal is, is really for a gross total resection uh, or at least a volume less than one to 1 1.5 uh, cubic centimeters of residual tumor. Um, the goal is to maximize the resection but not absolutely required to get out its entirety. So if the intraoperative uh, frozen section reveals um, that, the, uh, that it looks like a small blue cell tumor, um, it's in the midline, in the, uh, it looks like a medullo, then the goal is to get out as much as you can safely. We don't go diving into the brainstem, for example, to try to get out every last cell uh, because the reality is, is while more resection is better, um, we don't want to damage the child and many of our adjuvant therapies uh, will be useful in uh, managing these kids. Um, as I mentioned, so here's just the uh, um, literature that is shown with regards to, this is a very, this is really on the older side. This was early in my career. Uh, but again, the literature with regards to um, maximal safe resection is really our goal uh, in these cases. So um, we know that radiation and chemotherapy are particularly effective um, in uh, this particular diagnosis. And uh, I'll, I'll start to talk a little bit later about the targeting of this, but with regards to um, uh, medulloblastoma, uh, we, are, we have been looking at ways to um, reduce radiation um, and target things more readily, uh, but we also do craniospinal radiation in these patients. But we have a limitation, particularly in children who are um, you know, less than three or five years of age, excuse me. And then in the future, um, we, well, we have presently, we have uh, chemotherapy and we've got um, um, uh, bone marrow transplant. But again, you know, these are highly toxic um, uh, therapies. And so I, as I mentioned in the future, our hope is to be able to go uh, beyond uh, these uh, very comprehensive, but often very damaging um, uh, management tools. With regards to um, survival at this point, um, now, as I mentioned, uh, five years standard risk uh, survival is now upwards of uh, 70 plus percent. Um, even in the high risk patients, uh, we can now um, really uh, preserve life uh, uh, out a much, lo uh, much longer than when I uh, started. With regards to complications, uh, they're numerous and you can imagine as based on um, uh, where the tumors are located, very sensitive location, oftentimes have cerebellar dysfunction, cranial nerve deficits. Um, despite the fact that it, it seems like that these tumors present with an obstructive hydrocephalus, uh, we've had a very difficult time um, uh, having them shunt free. Um, we've tried weaning uh, the external ventricular drain for a period of time. Uh, we've uh, you know, tried the ETV, uh, but ultimately uh, many of these kids will develop hydrocephalus and require uh, ventricular peritoneal shunting. And then as uh, you can imagine, a meningitis, pseudomeningocele in the immediate post-op period, as well as cerebellar mutism uh, this has been less of a problem in that we uh, attempt to avoid um, uh, and tar uh, approach these tumors, uh, not necessarily right through the midline. Um, with regards to cerebellar anatomy, uh, I won't belabor it for this talk, but suffice it to say that if we, we found that if we went directly through the middle of the uh, vermis and completely split it, um, these patients, uh, you know, oftentimes um, ended up with uh, significant uh, deficits, including uh, uh, mutism. There has been some uh, concept that the function of the cerebellum includes uh, language on the right side. So um, at times I have taken a more left um, uh, perivermian uh, approach toward these tumors uh, based on this uh, concept. I'm not sure whether it made a difference as much as the extent of the um, uh, uh, dissection is really ultimately what the, um, whether these children ended up with um, mutism or not. So 
just some of the risk factors um, associated with mutism. And again, I won't belabor these, but suffice it to say it's um, midline location, uh, extensive vermian um, uh, splitting. And, and in those instances, um, many of these children will end up with mutism. Now, while it resolves, they never really get back what we call the prosody of speech. So the ability to you know, add inflection and up and down and those very sort of monotone um, uh, approach. With regards to ependymoma, it's kind of the third of the big three. Um, it's about 10% of pediatric brain tumors. You can see the incidence here. And again, I, I won't belabor these, um, uh, but suffice it to say that, you know, they can be infratentorial as well as supratentorial as well as spinal. And so, um, and or in all three locations at the same time. So again, um, one needs to be uh, cognizant of, of this particular uh, diagnosis. Usually it's not metastatic, so not diffused down into the spine at presentation, um, but it is metastatic at a, in about 20% of cases when it recurs. And so really getting that uh, tumor and, and as well, um, we tend to, during surgery, try to isolate the tumor. So with um, cotton patties in order to try to prevent seeding uh, below. Um, I'm not sure whether that truly makes a difference, but conceptually um, not having the uh, tumor irrigated and, and um, uh, diffuse uh, during the uh, procedure uh, to remove the tumor uh, would seem to be a good idea. It's a, it can be slow growing, but it is relentless. And it, we know that uh, we absolutely need to maximize the resection. Unfortunately, maximize it um, even if it's going to result in, in a known, um, uh, di um, a known uh, neurological deficit. Um, we know that complete resection predicts improved survival, um, but unfortunately, about only about 30% are really completely, completely resectable. Um, radiation and chemotherapy have not been particularly helpful. We still use them because it has improved uh, survival, uh, but this is the issue about why I think that targeted treatments in the future, and I'll go over these a little bit later. Um, it is often a difficult choice to go for maximal resection and high morbidity versus safe resection and high mortality. So it's a, a difficult weight when it comes to uh, the diagnosis of ependymoma. Um, other therapies um, obviously include surgery, but um, the other therapies and their role um, still remains to be uh, seen. So just some of the treatment protocols, just um, this is just a nice table from, uh, from now a paper, it's about 10 years old, but suffice it to say, you know, these are uh, the, the different tumor types that uh, you might encounter. Um, all of them involve surgery, except for brainstem gliomas. Um, uh, in those instances, if it's a typical um, uh, 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 brainstem DIPG, for example, um, it's not, we're not going to be able to go in and, and do surgery in those instances. Uh, the question about whether you need it, you can get a diagnosis and whether a diagnosis with a biopsy will be useful um, depends, again, on your center and uh, what other therapies are available. Uh, we know with germ cell tumors that a biopsy is quite useful. So if we were to identify and uh, diagnose a germinoma, um, you know, we do not need to do a, a large resective surgery in those patients. Uh, so if we suspect um, a germinoma, teenage, um, young male um, with, who presents with obstructive hydrocephalus with a midline tumor, you know, we tend to uh, biopsy those first to see if indeed uh, we have a germinoma. There are, in, there are even centers that based on the imaging, uh, they'll start radiation and um, uh, and see if indeed the tumor shrinks away. And if that does occur, then they assume it's a germinoma. Um, just again, this is just survival um, from a while back. And, uh, but again, it just shows the difference is that we know that uh, children uh, overall tend to do better 
uh, with CNS tumors as compared to uh, adults. And then this is just survival by tumor type. And again, I won't belabor these since we've talked about them. I did want to talk a little bit about radiation because radiation is a particular uh, mainstay of therapy for uh, pediatric brain tumors. Uh, we know that the risk is, is high uh, for developmental delay, particularly if you've got to use uh, radiation and high doses of radiation in very young children. Uh, endocrinopathies uh, can also occur uh, with um, uh, uh, cranial uh, irradiation, uh, visual loss, um, vasculopathy. Um, I have dealt with a number of children uh, with Moya Moya uh, who had previously had radiation as young children. Um, malignant transformation is always a concern in, in dealing uh, with this. This is an old paper, one of the original ones, just where they identified the extent of um, how radiation impacted on um, uh, brain, brain development, the skull, these kinds of things. Um, uh, so again, radiation, if we can um, minimize radiation in these patients, uh, then uh, that would be kind of our, our goal and our target. Um, with regards to some of the long-term effects, uh, this just uh, with regards to comparison of radiation versus chemotherapy, very frequently um, they have very similar uh, types of uh, impact and one needs to um, uh, be cognizant of these, uh, especially uh, going forward when developing a treatment plan. Uh, with regards to um, chemotherapy, uh, again, uh, frequently, unfortunately, with these children, uh, intellectual decline, endocrine dysfunction, especially if it's um, combined with uh, radiation. So with regards to the recommendations in, in regards to uh, radiation therapy, low-grade tumors um, really don't um, uh, do radiation. We just maximize surgical resection. Intermediate tumor, the question of aggressive early radiation versus uh, chemotherapy followed by radiation has been discussed. And then high-grade, um, usually it is um, you know, basically doing maximal safe resection, um, comprehensive chemotherapy as, as well as um, uh, radiation. So in the future though, I think as I, as I mentioned, um, this was our standard, but now with uh, improvements in our uh, imaging capability in tumor markers and uh, those kinds of things, um, I think that now uh, very much so, um, we're able to much better uh, uh, diagnose uh, location, know where structure or function are, so we can do maybe safer surgeries, more targeted surgeries. Um, if we're able to now identify tumor markers, uh, again, this might be a, a targeted approach toward how we do um, our management of these patients. Um, and so I, I think uh, the future is now, and and uh, very fortunate for many of you, residents, students, fellows, young faculty. Um, I think this is really an exciting era when it comes to uh, the diagnosis and management of, uh, of brain tumors. Um, classically, we've done routine pathology and histochemistry, which I've shown you. I think now when we go forward, uh, it's gonna be much more individualized um, approach using uh, genomics, genetics, proteomics, even epigenetics. And so it goes on and on and on when it comes to what what will be available for the diagnosis of these patients. Um, these are just some of the uh, genetic loci where we know uh, the errors occur in these patients um, and in these particular tumors. Uh, here's PNET, medulloblastoma, astrocytoma, high grades, and again, some of the uh, disorders where we see them. Uh, particularly interesting was, uh, you know, neurofibroma, neurofibromatosis, where, you know, we do know the, the defect uh, early on. And so that's really where one thinks about a single genetic uh, defect resulting in tumor development. So here was really the model of where everything has come uh, forward in the future. And these are just some of the others uh, that we see. You can 
uh, many of you uh, recognize that uh, you know tuberous sclerosis and subependymal uh, a giant cell tumor as as well again a genetic defect resulting in uh, a tumor development and again when it comes to medullose um, it's come a long way from just its original nomenclature um, the reality is is that you know now uh, medullose are, are identified and it's now upwards of 10 years, which I can't believe has gone by. Uh, but <clears throat> we now, uh, back in 2010, the Taylor group up in Toronto identified the different groups of um, medulloblastomas. And again, um, uh, this, this has really revolutionized and changed uh, our approach toward uh, medulloblastomas. And again, the analysis really was really quite unique um, in being able to identify the genomic targets uh, for uh, medulloblastomas. And by no understanding these different categories of Wnt, sonic hedgehog versus group C and D, what you had were four unique genetically distinct subgroups that all had differences in how they responded to our treatments. And so you no longer have a brain tumor and call it a brain tumor. You no longer call it just a medulloblastoma. Um, and at, at, at least standardly now, we classify whether they're a sonic hedgehog, medulloblastoma, or a Wnt, or a group C or D based on, these, um, on, on this revolutionary uh, uh, discovery. And so by identifying then the subclasses um, through um, antibody subtyping, we can really now start to better understand these um, different subclasses. And so the question is, is why does it really matter? Well, we, we understand that it matters because the outcomes are different based on where these different subgroups lie. So they are not the same medulloblastoma that we all talk about. Now, while the management, <clears throat> excuse me, is still about um, removing maximal safe resection after surgery, uh, the reality is, is that this clinical relevance is going to be even that much more important. Uh, we are going to be able to start to look on um, um, at age as onset. So here you can appreciate the different groups at the different ages. So we know that there are differences with regards to these tumors, to when they uh, come on within um, uh, patients. Um, we can see here with regards to survival. And again, group C really, <clears throat> excuse me, abysmal survival. Group D, um, kind of a median, really our, our sonic hedgehog and wind, very responsive to our uh, present uh, management. And then with regards to now we say, well, we've got these four different groups. Well, the reality is, is that we know that with these type of difficult survivors, can we start to break them down into even further um, subgroups? And indeed we can. So here's an instance medulloblastomas. Uh, this is more recent work. You can see the original four groups here, and now the four subgroups with looking at um, MIC amplification, looking at other, um, other types of um, markers that really start to hone down uh, the differences in these tumors. Here's a better graphical um, uh, representation of the different subgroups. And you can see really now being able to categorize these to really look at all the histology and the, um, whether the, they're more likely to metastasize or not, um, the, the differences in their uh, genetic uh, dis, um, uh, mutations, as well as some of the other events now you have a much more um, uh, targeted approach when looking at how we might start to develop novel therapies uh, for these uh, patients. And similarly with ependymoma, uh, again, uh, we had different grades and this is a very, uh, as you can see, an old slide with regards to um, ependymoma, but now even ependymomas, you can see from the work from uh, Pagelar and group uh, back just a few years ago, now being able to create all the different subtypes of ependymoma that we can see. And you can see this uh, very uh, nicely uh, graphic representation 
uh, that shows the key uh, genetic and epigenetic phenomena that uh, we see with regards to um, ependymal tumors, whether they have their methylation, um, chromosomal in instability, age distribution, gender distribution, as well as survival. So we can see these, um, you know, as you can imagine, a, a mixed papillary ependymoma. Um, you can see pa good patient survival versus the anaplastic uh, astro ependymoma, anaplastic ependymoma, um, supratentorial, very poor uh, survival. So again, um, whether it be uh, location, uh, genetic drivers, um, age, these are all gonna be factors uh, as uh, one moves forward. And one could even look at these graphically, uh, you know, green and red as to, you know, who is gonna do well versus who's not gonna do well at present state. And then we can start to target our research toward understanding why these patients don't do as well and what we might do to, um, to target those. And in essence, because based on survival, uh, we've defined really now going back to very two defined groups, two distinct diseases of those that um, do well um, versus those that do not. And so again, as you understand more and as we start to be able to um, tease out these different issues, we can really start to better define um, uh, our targeting and our research and our management. And again, I won't belabor these. Um, just uh, lastly, with regards to DIPG, this is a particularly difficult uh, disease process. Um, uh, it's, it's a devastating uh, diagnosis. Average age of diagnosis is around four to 10 years of age. There's about, in the US, about 300 cases. So it's not a common a tumor, but unfortunately the survival is, is very poor. It is the primary cause of brain tumor death right now because of our ability to um, manage these other um, uh, cases. Um, this is just a patient who was very responsive uh, to radiation. Um, and uh, uh, this was a fortunate case. Uh, the contrast to that, not really much of a difference in the, the tumor diagnosis. Uh, but not really super responsive um, in, uh, in this patient population. So again, I, I won't belabor the, the numbers, um, but um, it is a particularly uh, poor diagnosis. But this is also a difference when one looks at brainstem tumors. Uh, here, the Pontine uh, tumor, very devastating diagnosis versus the, the medullary uh, brainstem tumor often has a much better prognosis, more responsive to radiation. It tends to be a, a lower grade uh, tumor. So again, with regards to uh, future, um, I mentioned earlier about uh, laser ablation uh, using targeted um, therapies. Um, this has been around. Here's a case just of a hypothalamic hematoma for epilepsy. You can do a very deep targeted lesion uh, so it has been indicated for what we've used it mostly for is uh, epileptic foci, uh, but we've also used it for tumors and even for cavernous malformations. Here's that, um, here's the um, hypothalamic hematoma post ablation. You can see where we were able to target this. You can see the laser probe right in the, um, in the uh, hematoma, and this is after T1 with contrast. Uh, we've also used it for epilepsy to get uh, to do mesiotemporal uh, sclerosis cases uh, here to do targeted without an open uh, case. Uh, but in the, actually, in this case, um, there was a low grade tumor. So um, this was one that was for both. Um, one could do cortical um, uh, dysplasias or, or cortical tumors. So uh, there is the possibility of using uh, this therapy uh, for this. This was a patient with a recurrent medullo. Uh, so instead of going back in this case, uh, we did a laser ablation in the posterior fossa. Um, and then this patient went on for bone marrow transplant. Um, with regards to targeted therapies, um, again, lots on the future. Um, I won't belabor these just because of uh, time. Um, and as well with DIPG, 
I think that we need to better target these. And so we've started to biopsy our brainstem tumors with the idea that we're looking for specific mutations that may make them more responsive uh, to certain types of uh, chemotherapies. And again, just in the interest of time and to um, uh, allow for questions, I'll just uh, glance over these. But again, if we can define these different um, aspects of something like a DIPG, then I think we'll be very fortunate in being able to come up with novel therapies that uh, we would not be able to have, uh, that we've not been able to do to date. So if we can come up with these, our, our goal is um, to get tissue in these patients so that we can apply these more advanced techniques for uh, diagnosis and then uh, potentially for therapy. With regards to radiation, uh, again, when we give, as I mentioned earlier, a significant amount of radiation to the developing brain, we end up with lots of different potential toxicity, especially if it's craniospinal. Um, we know that there is a lot of work that has shown the different sensitivities of, of um, normal tissue to radiation. Um, but <clears throat> for that reason, you know, our more targeted therapies or radiation that may have less toxicity um, be useful. And so um, we've worked collaboratively with our partners here in um, um, Phoenix uh, with Mayo Clinic really starting to look at how we might use uh, proton beam uh, therapy for uh, certain types of tumors. Um, we know that um, proton beam has less toxicity to the brainstem, for example. And so we will oftentimes uh, use um, this therapy, <clears throat> especially if uh, the brainstem is gonna be within our targeted field. Um, here is a child with a polymyxoid tumor, uh, here you can see the uh, radiation plan using proton beam in order to um, uh, try to uh, manage this uh, particularly uh, uh, difficult tumor. Um, here you can just see the isodose, li isodose lines and the drop off of radiation. And again, very targeted, but yet still encompassing what would be expected to be the, uh, the range of the, uh, the tumor. Um, Here's just an example of a three-year-old who had a recurrent uh, low-grade uh, glioma, had undergone multiple operations, uh, multiple craniotomies, failed chemotherapy, was eventually referred uh, for proton beam. Um, this was the, uh, again, the uh, radiation dosing. Again, thinking about the age of this child, um, here was the um, a targeted plan and again, you know, being able to uh, reduce the radiation um, in this uh, patient uh, population would be uh, ideal. And so at least gaining local control for that uh, patient. So just in summary, um, we know that uh, pediatric brain tumors are complex and uh, we can't just categorize them as a brain tumor. Uh, and we don't categorize almost any disease now as just X. Um, it is very much a complex disease and not easy to understand with any one measure. So whether it be imaging or immunohistochemistry or whatever, we don't depend on any of them, but rather the, the concurrence of, of uh, data. Um, we know that it's a multimodality diagnosis and as a result, it's gonna require a multimodality treatment approach um, in order for us to treat and cure these children. Um, as I hope I've given you a taste, there's a lot of um, great work that's being done in the diagnosis and what I think will be the therapeutic interventions of the future. Um, and it's only through further research and multidisciplinary teams that uh, these interventions will be realized. I'm very fortunate to work with a great group here at uh, Barrow Neurological Institute at Phoenix Children's Hospital, um, as well as Mayo Clinic uh, and multiple others. Um, and so uh, with that, I'll thank you and um, see if there are any questions. Thank you, David. I think excellent talk. It was very comprehensive. I think we went through all uh, where we started from and where we are today. And it's amazing. Um, some of the stuff that's coming up uh, is really astonishing and uh, it's awesome. I think 
the treatment is changing uh, very, very fast. We have loads of questions up uh, on the chat already. Uh, uh, we will get, uh, first of all, there is Mamat who wants to uh, talk. So we're just going to unmute him and see uh, what question he has. Uh, Mamat, please introduce yourself, where you're from, and then ask your question. Um, Mamat disappeared on us, so no worries. So we'll, we'll go to the question. Um, and we have Nadim, who's our co-host. Um, he, Nadim, is a pediatric uh, neurosurgeon in Lahore. Uh, in uh, in north of Pakistan, so we're just going to unmute him as well. Nadim, welcome. Nadim, can you hear us? You're unmuted. So I think let's go to the um, questions from the chat and see where we go. We have um, we have another question from Tija, so we're just going to unmute Tija. Hello. I can, if you want, I can read the question and we can. Sure. We, we have the first person, Tija. Can you hear us? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. sir is yes. Where are you Pune? from? And you can ask your question. Just introduce yourself. So I'm a resident neurosurgery from Hyderabad, uh, uh, India. Very good. Uh, sir, is there a role of tractography uh, in uh, uh, brainstem lesions, brainstem astrocytoma? That's a great Can question. Um, yeah, we do use tractography um, now to look at which way the fibers, if we're going to try to resect. As I mentioned, we don't do a lot of um, resection of brainstem tumors, uh, but we do uh, use uh, do biopsies and we do laser therapy. So um, we'll use tractography to see which way the tracks are. I didn't show it on my medul recurrent medulloblastoma slide, but we did have tractography in that. And so the reason that I chose that approach was to avoid uh, the fibers and to get the best um, uh, alignment of my laser probe uh, in those cases, in that case. Okay, there's a question from Anwar Luck. He's asking, is there any targeted therapy for metal blastoma based on these new pathways that we know? <laughs> so, uh, yes, they do do um, uh, targeted therapy based on those. Uh, for example, on a group C, we, um, you know, I'm sorry, a sonic hedgehog or a wind, uh, we will do very much more targeted chemotherapy, less toxicity. Uh, based on the MIC amplification, um, they do change the chemotherapy around in, in those instances. Um, again, it, it, there are some evolving new protocols based on that. Uh, but again, recognize that it's only really in the last three, four, five years that that even these sub-sub classifications have come about uh, that uh, they're now starting to do clinical trials. And as you can imagine, clinical trials take a little while, but uh, uh, I'm hopeful. And uh, we have started to change what we do based on um, which group they sit within. And depending on what group it is, um, and, uh, depending on which particular type it is, uh, the decision regarding operating first or giving some uh, chemotherapy first or radiotherapy first is all has also changed. Um, you know that's an interesting question. You know until we really have tumor uh, tissue type and to be able to do the typing, so we don't go in presumptively with knowing what the tumor is. Um, so we'll frequently go in with safe maximal resection, and if there's a recurrence and we know what type of tumor it is. We, we continue to use that terminology, you know, safe maximal um, resection, because again, with the targeted therapies, our hope and our belief is that uh, we'll see uh, much better survival with less morbidity. Okay, there's a question from Nadim, and his question is, what's your strategy for pineal germinomas? At what age we can start radiotherapy in kid kiddies? So that's a good question. So uh, we use radiation therapy mostly in children older than five years of age. Um, and so if we get um, uh, those instances um, uh, where they're younger, and I have to be honest, I can't think of one that I found that was really younger. There was, there's been a mixed germ cell tumor, which we ended up having to, we did a resection on, uh, but a pure germinoma, I, I don't think that I've seen it in a very young child. So, you know, we feel comfortable to, to do radiation in those instances. 
Okay, there's Andrea uh, Brunori from Roma. And the question is, do you use emergency ETV in post first star presenting with acute hydro as an emergency and scheduled surgery at an elective setting? Um, we would, we don't do ETV. We would just put in an external ventricular drain because we would want to be using it in the post-op period uh, to drain away blood and extra cells and things like that. So we would tend to um, uh, put in an external ventricular drain and then do um, earliest elective uh, surgery as possible. If they're not too symptomatic, um, we'll start them just on steroids and see if we can hold off on the ETV uh, until uh, we do it intraoperatively. Okay, well, and there's a question from Barbara and she's asking, is after removal of cerebellar astrocytoma, gross total resection, how long is the follow-up? So we would tend to, after diagnosis, we would get um, imaging, usually either three, three months, depending on the histology, um, or um, every six months for a year or so, and then do yearly for about five or six years, and then do every other year for up to about 10 to 12 years. Um, after that, um, you know, sometimes we'll do spot screens, particularly since, um, you know, if they've gotten... Um, if it were a more high grade tumor and it was, we, we thought we got a cure, um, but yet it was kind of a higher histologic characteristic. Well, then in those instances, we would uh, be concerned about recurrence or secondary tumors if they've got other therapy. Okay, that is Brahim Kamun. And his question is uh, regarding medulloblastoma and ependymoma. Is there any reliable sign to know there's infiltration of fourth ventricle or prepontine imaging of some kind that you can differentiate between medullo and ependymoma? <laughs> well, this is why I, I joke that we, we have an ongoing bet. Um, someone buys the uh, drink, uh, <laughs> like a soda or, or uh, iced tea or something, um, based on who's right on what they guess. And so uh, we, we pit ourselves against the radiologists even uh, because they're classically wrong. So uh, we throw it out there and, and, and then, you know, and, and then for the junior person, we'll say um, with a post fossa tumor, uh, do they think it could potentially be an ABC, which in our parlance is aneurysmal bone cyst. And we see if they've been doing any reading or not. So, uh, so uh, you know, again, it's up in the air. I don't, we don't, uh, we don't often are able to make a distinction. But having said that, you know, medullos tend to be more likely to be midline. Um, the ependymoma is more off to the side. If there's tumor extending out through, um, you know, through the foramen elushka, then, uh, then, you know, in those instances, then it's more likely to be uh, an ependymoma. Uh, so uh, it, th those are some of the the characteristics you'll know ahead of time. Uh, but again, if, if the goals for both are maximal safe resection, um, you know, uh, uh, it oftentimes doesn't really matter what the tumor type is. Okay, there is Dharaji. And the question is, do you believe in gross total resection in medullos? Uh, because a lot of centers are using uh, intraoperative MRI to achieve maximum resection. Is that the right way to go? <laughs> so that's a great question. And and we don't have a, an intraoperative MRI. Um, we will go for anything less than a cubic centimeter of tumor. Um, so uh, I know this, the statistics say 1.5. We try to err on the side of being a little more aggressive. But if I've got a tumor embedded in the brainstem, I'm not going to go and use an intraoperative MRI to get that out. Now, if, if I've done what I thought was a maximal tumor um, removal, and there's more than 1.5 cubic centimeters, then I go back and remove it. If there was something that was maybe tucked up under or very deep that I didn't appreciate or something like that. Um, I have to be honest, I haven't had to do that. Um, uh, so, uh, but that is what kind of the recommendation is, especially if they're a very young child, um, because we can't give radiation in those instances, then we would recommend um, um, going back and, and getting out as a more of the tumor. Okay, we have a last question from Nilofar, and she's asking, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you're mentioning about lumbar puncture and CSF collection. 
for staging of astrocytoma? Is that a standard management before or after surgery? So no. Um, so what I was mentioning was is that in dealing with um, tumors where you're going to do staging, if it's a, a hemispheric cerebellar astrocytoma, clearly we don't, you know, um, the, the routine is not to do a lumbar puncture. We'll do just imaging of the spine to look for uh, if there's other tumor. If it's a high-grade tumor, then in those instances, we would get CSF. And these are all done after. Um, uh, we do not um, depend on the ventricular CSF only. We uh, do depend on the lumbar for high-grade tumors where we are staging them as well as uh, determining um, you know, again, where they're at at the baseline, if it's disseminated disease or not. Okay, Mohamed Usman, to this question I, I want to ask as well, because there's, it keeps coming back and forth. So this post fossa tumor, obstructive hydrocephalus, presenting with signs of high ICP. Do you do EVD, ETV, or shunt to start with? And then what do you do it in the same setting or afterwards? So I never do a shunt because our goal is not to have a shunt in that child. Um, we would, if there is a patient who uh, we give um, uh, steroids to and doesn't get better, uh, then uh, we would put in an, an external ventricular drain. Um, we do not do ETV up front. Um, as I said, we, we've not seen these, they, they present with obstructive hydrocephalus, but we like to have the external ventricular drain to drain away blood and tumor cells that may percolate up because we do the patients prone with the head down. So, you know, uh, this is a way for us to try to drain it. I do the ETV, or, I mean, excuse me, I do the external ventricular drain, the EVD, usually at the time of surgery. Um, I put them in the prone position. I use the image guidance. I do an occipital uh, EVD um, in order to uh, drain, uh, drain during surgery, but also to relax the dura uh, have been, um, not my case, but there was a, one of our morbidity mortality. They thought they could get by. The didn't, ventricles looked kind of small. Um, they didn't look big. Um, they went in and there was a herniation of the cerebellum and the brainstem and contents when they opened the dura. So I like it there. I make sure the dura is relaxed when I open the dura, and that's why I have the external ventricular drain there. Um, I think uh, that was brilliant. I think all you answered all the questions that were there. And I, although this was such a difficult topic and to cover all the um, tumors was amazing and, and to come up with such a presentation, I think you can see there are loads of people talking about a great presentation. So we are grateful to you. Wonderful. Uh, if people have more questions, they can write on the chat. And uh, Professor Adelson, uh, if he has time, would be able to reply on the chat. In the meantime, uh, in the interest of time, we would go to uh, Professor Amjad Shah. Uh, Professor Shah, you can unmute yourself. You, there you are. If you can share yeah. your slides. And he's going to be talking about applied anatomy for lumbar disc prolapse. And this talk is specially meant for trainees. Um, Amjad is a great uh, teacher. Amjad, welcome. Thank you. So Amjad works in, in Coventry um, in UK, and he's in the Warwickshire um, NHS Trust. And he's the lead uh, neurosurgeon at uh, NHS Coventry Hospital. No, it's not letting me share my screen. Uh, uh, Meg, would you? And you are the co host. He's already allowed. He's co host. Okay. You are the co host, so you should be able to share. So you can stop other people sharing. You're the co host. Oh. All right. Can you hear me, Salman? Yes, we can hear you very well. Thank you. And okay. is your Wi-Fi working well today? Sure. Now I have to take time off from the hospital to do that. <laughs> I apologize. I no, woke no. Uh, Professor Adelson up earlier than what he thought. <laughs> so I no, apologize. the hospital, there's a big load on the internet and you don't get some time good uh, communication. So uh, Salman kindly requested yesterday to give me this talk. So I prepared it uh, in a very quick time and I have to borrow a few slides from my colleagues, so I thought I should tell you up front. Now, we all know lumbar discectomy could be a very satisfying operation most of the time, but at times the results are not desirable. And why that happens? Because of inadequate exposure, inadequate approach, 
inadequate choice of oppression, inadequate decompression, and at times operating at the wrong level. So a simple oppression can turn into bigger oppression and can end up in a major complication. And the main reason for that is that at times the anatomy is so difficult. And if we hurriedly study the scan and we don't see the underlying pathology clearly, then we might end up doing the wrong operation for wrong reasons. So my Sorry, whole Andrew, talk can is- you share your slides? Can you share your slides? Yeah, can you see my slide or not? Not yet. Not yet? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so just click on share slides. So when I share, I get this screen. So maybe, maybe unshare from the top. On the top, it says stop screen share. On the top, there will be a sign saying stop screen share. Top of your computer. Okay. Yes. So I can see you now on the screen. Good, so you have stopped. So now go back to screen share again, share the screen at the bottom. Yeah, and I get all these different things here. Emad, can you help please? So you can click on the share screen button. Yeah. Then it will take to another window. Yeah. There you are, yeah. you're, you're there. Yeah. So, yeah. so now you can so. click on your presentation window. Minimize this one. Okay. And then I can do this. Can you see it now? Yeah. Yes, sir. So just just um, make it. Should I change it to slideshow now? Please. So can we see it now? Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Okay. So what I was saying was that inadequate exposure approach or decompression can end up in having a, a poor outcome. And all that hinges on the anatomy and the pre-op study of the scan. So it's very important. So that's what I think this, my talk is, is uh, aimed at the trainees. So that we all know the technique, we use different techniques for doing this operation. It can be open, it can be minimally invasive, can be microscopic, endoscopic, and percutaneous. And believe me, I'm doing this operation for 30 years. You can't do always this operation just by using one approach or one technique. So you, you need to be familiar with different approaches to do this operation successfully. So approaches, it could be midline, it could be paramedian, it could be transforaminal or lateral approach, postrolateral, and in ALF, we end up doing discectomy anteriorly. Now, so I'll show you this anatomical picture. If you see, so the main approaches are through the interlaminar, either in the midline and paramedian. Then we have a transforaminal approach. And then we have a retroperitoneal approach and postrolateral approach. And occasionally, as I said, we end up doing surgery through the anterior route. So how to decide which approach and which technique is appropriate for the patient? So we need to know where the disc fragment is. We need to study the scan carefully. We need to know the size of the fragment. We need to know whether there's associated canal stenosis or bony compression, lateral recess narrowing or foraminal stenosis. So it's very important. Otherwise, I think you'll end up doing the inadequate operation. Lumbar disc herniation, again, when you study the scan, you need to know that fragment is mostly central, paracentral, or is extending into the foramen, and if it is extending into the foramen, is it suitable for interlaminar approach or a lateral approach? Or the fragment is extra foraminal, whether it's suitable for a microscopic approach or endoscopic approach. If the fragment is far lateral, then you need to know whether you can do posterolaterally or from the lateral approach. So it's very important that you need to study scan carefully. The other important thing is where to give your incision. This 
how much length of incision is needed to tackle the problem. It can be as small as two centimeter and sometimes you have to be three to four centimeter. Then is the location in relation to the disc space. Whether your incision should be centered at the disc space, whether your incision should be above the disc space or below the disc space. So it's very important. Otherwise you'll end up <coughs> during the surgery struggling doing this operation. If you carefully study the scan, if the post, I'll show you all this later on the, on the scan and anatomical pictures. If there is a straightforward, simple posterior lateral disc collapse, usually your uh, incision should be centered one third above and two third below the disc space. If it's a foraminal disc, it usually should be based two third above the disc space and one third below the disc space. And if it's central disc collapse, it's usually if, uh, above and below the disc space equally. And in far lateral disc layers, it's usually above the disc space. And in nerve root compression from the articular process, it's usually the incision should be below the disc space. And I'll show you all these on anatomical pictures. So if you don't design or fashion your incision accordingly, where the disc fragment is, then you struggle most of the time during the surgery. And then you end up having a bigger incision and a bigger exposure. But if you study the scan carefully, then you can do this operation with the targeted minimal invasive technique. If your incision is not cracked, and when you're making the incision, and when you're checking the level, make sure your needle is perpendicular to the skin. If you go at an angle, then what will you end up having is a wrong incision because your tip will be pointing either superiorly or inferiorly, and it might be parallel with the disc space that will give you an adequate, inadequate exposure. Then there's location in relation to the midline, whether you, your incision should be central, paramedian, lateral, or posterolateral. So I'll show you a few pictures to how to, so the first one, if you can see this picture, the, this is a central canal. So say if this is L5 and this is L4, so if you have a lateral recess narrowing, the lateral recess is between the, the medial border of the fast, uh, pedicle above and pedicle below. So if you see all these areas above the disc space, and if you're dealing with the foraminal disc, so foramina is again between the upper pedicle and lower pedicle, and most of the problem is above the disc space. So that your incision, if you're doing it, it should be roughly two third above the disc and one third below the disc. And that's more than enough that two centimeter here will deal with the lateral recess. It will deal with the foraminal disc. On the other hand, if you have a posterior lateral disc, which will be sitting here, then your disc is only one third above the disc and is two third below the disc. And the other pathology which can kink the disc uh, nerve root here is hypertrophic pedicle and hypertrophic superior articular facet of the inferior vertebra. Again, the incision should be a, at least two thirds below the disc space. So it's very important to understand that. So this is the real scan picture. So this gives you further information. So this is L34 level. This is if you have a, a lateral approach and you're going through the foramen. So if you see here, I'll just take this down. So this is a pedicle of L3. So this is the L3 nerve root. This is the lateral border of the thecal sac or the L4 nerve root, which is coming down like that. And that's the inferior pedicle. So this is your safe triangle to enter it. And in terms of the incision, if you're dealing with the central disc, so most of the time you can see in a central. If it's a paracentral disc, you can be one or two millimeter lateral to the midline. Then if you have a foraminal disc, see how far it is from the midline. And then if you have the far lateral disc, so then you, you, or extra foraminal disc, you're even quite far out. So it's very important the, where you fashion your incision in terms of its location in relation to the disc, whether it should be above the disc 
below the disc and how far it should be from the midline. Otherwise, you'll struggle again throughout. So it's very important. And I'll keep repeating this picture for you to understand. Again, the extent of exposure, you can do this operation through two centimeter in, in CN, uh, but it all depends on the loca location of the fragment and associated bony compression, disc height and foraminal height. So if the foraminal height is reduced, disc height is reduced, nerve has got uh, very little space to come out. So not only the patient will need discectomy, patient will also need the bony decompression. Otherwise you end up doing inadequate operation and inadequate decompression. So in terms of the exposure, if you, I'll show you this picture again, again, if you're doing it for the operation is if you're doing it for the central decompression, then if you see, this is the spinous process. This is a part of the lamina. If, if you're doing unilateral, you, you'll have to remove that amount. If you're doing bilateral, then you have to go on both sides. That's only for the central canal stenosis. So see the extent of resection for everything. So uh, about two thirds of the upper lamina goes or more, all of the lamina goes and upper part of the lower lamina goes. And then you're from one pedicle to the another pedicle. And if possible, you have to keep number three, the pars or the isthmus intact. If say you're doing this exposure just for micro discectomy, then you don't have to take most of the time any of the lamina. If anything, you just have to trim only the inferior part of the superior lamina. At times you can, if a soft disc prolapse, you can just do through the interlaminar approach by just taking the ligament and that's more than enough. On the other hand, if you see here, which is the, uh, I was talking the foraminal stenosis due to reduced disc height, then most of the decompression is here. And if you're doing it for lateral recess and if you're doing it for the postulator disc press, then this is all what you need to do. So it's very important to understand this picture that how much you need to remove uh, and what's the underlying problem. If it's a young patient and it's only got a soft disc prolapse, then you might not need to do any bony decompression. On the other hand, in patient where there's associated bony pathology, either lateral recess narrowing or hypertrophic uh, uh, articular process, or there is a hypertrophic uh, and reduced foramen, then you have to do the decompression accordingly. I'll, I'll show you this in different slides. So it's very important to uh, know pre-hand how much decompression you will need. So I've, I've chosen five different scans. And if uh, any of the trainee can each take one, and at the end of the talk, I'll show these scans again to discuss what type of incision, what type of approach, and what type of surgery will be appropriate in these patients. So the first one is a central disc prolapse. If somebody can just take that, please. The next one is uh, in a young patient, a postulateral disc prolapse with no other associated bony problem. Just raise your hand so that we can uh, have, so one person is there and for the second one, just raise your hand, anybody? wants to take this. Come on, all the juniors, so many people there. Raise your hands. Anybody? Anybody who wants to take this? Uh, Mama, just raise your hand there so that we can have you there. Hello. Okay, no, Parvat, Parvat, wait, we're not discussing this at the moment, just raise, we're getting people to raise their hands. Yeah, I want okay. them to give, I want to give them time to think about it. This one, third scan is of a lateral recess narrowing on the left side. So somebody takes that. Fourth one is, if you can see L45 disc into the foramen, see the normal foramen. Hands, please. Two more so, hands, come on. Can somebody raise hands again? 
we just need two more people uh, don't worry amjad at the end we okay. will unmute okay. somebody and ask them questions okay, Parvat that's and fine. Munawar are there so I've, I've got five scenarios central disk post lateral disk lateral recess narrowing foraminal disk and then i've got this far lateral disk here so i think it's important to know where they will place their incision in relation to the midline in relation to the disk space and what approach and what technique they would like to use and there's another far lateral disc here you can see it's a big far lateral disc sitting here so <clears throat> to to know what will be the appropriate operation technique uh, i think you need to know a few things one is three concept uh, three story concept then you need to know three zones and i'll show you all this and then you need to know foraminal anatomy and particular anatomy it, it, so the three story concept which was uh, uh, originally presented by mcculloch is uh, that your your disk is first floor the bottom uh, upper end of the bottom vertebra is your basement and the middle of the upper vertebra is your attic and i tell you why it is important as i go along so you need to know this anatomically so these so those were the three story concept then you need to know about the zones so if you're dealing with the central canal uh, stenosis and central uh, disc prolapse then that's your central canal zone if you're dealing with the lateral recess and uh, that's the lateral recess zone which is a subarticular zone if you're dealing with the foraminal zone that is a foraminal zone lateral to the lateral recess and i'll show you on the pictures again and again and then you have an extra foraminal zone of far lateral disc so the remember the far lateral disc is sitting here if you keep fishing it from here or here or here you're not going to get it and same can happen with the foraminal or extra foraminal so it's very important to understand this anatomy and i'm going to repeat this picture as i said again and again so if i now show you this picture again so if you see here so that, that uh, that's the pedicle of 3 that's the pedicle of 4 that lateral recess is uh, at the medial part of the uh, upper pedicle and the medial part of the lower pedicle makes the lateral recess and if you go further lateral So your foramen is made by the inferior part uh, border of the pedicle of upper bar and the superior part, uh, border of the inferior pedicle so that's your foramen so it's very important you know the boundaries and where the disc is sitting so this is another way of understanding it if say you have a disc just sitting here which is a posterolateral disc and this is l45 it will be only compressing the l5 nerve root but the same disc if is extending into lateral recess and foramen it might be catch, catching either both nerves or it if it is only here in the foramen or extra foramen it will be causing pressure only on the l4 nerve so it's the l4 nerve you need to decompress not l5 but if it's posterolateral disc then it will be compressing the l5 but remember the same disc can compress both nerves at times then you will have to decompress both nerves if you don't study the scan carefully and you end up doing l45 discectomy without doing the foraminectomy and taking the foraminal part of the disc you will never ever be able to get the good results so it's very important to remember this so so foraminal zone is here so if you're doing all your surgery here you won't get anything out and you won't be able to decompress properly so this is the further anatomy of the foraminal zone this is if you're coming from the lateral approach not the interlaminar you're seeing it from out to in so if the foramen again is uh, you need to remember three zones so zone 1 is foramen itself and if you see the, if this is 3 4 so this is the three nerve root this is the four nerve root coming out down like that and this is the safe triangle uh, so the you will find the disc under the nerve root the upper nerve root and it's the l3 nerve root you are decompressing and how you find it all you have to do is find the l3 transverse process you go through the wilsey approach find l3 uh, transverse process and you'll be next into the nerve root and then you find the disc otherwise you'll keep struggling all day you won't find it And, and the difference between foraminal disc and the far lateral disc as i showed you in the previous the zone is the far lateral disc is here is above the l3 nerve root 
It's not below. If you keep finding it here, you won't find it. So you find the L3 narrow root, then go further lateral and you'll find the far lateral disc. And you can use endoscope or you can use microscope. The main thing is knowing where you will find it. So it's very important. So the same thing again. So if this is L3-4, so this is this uh, superior pedicle. This is the inferior pedicle. This is the L3 narrow root coming. This is the L4 narrow root, which will be coming exiting later on. This is the exited narrow root. So if there is a foraminal disc, you're operating here. And if there is extra foraminal, you're operating here. And if there is far lateral disc, you'll be operating here. So it's a safe triangle. So you need to know all these zones. Now, this is the normal dimension of the foramen and the safe triangle again. It's again the same thing. The nerve will be here, ganglion will be here. Then the uh, medial part of the uh, thecal sac will be here and foramen and ligaments is the same thing. This one you need to know for endoscopic zone for intervertebrate. If you're using the uh, endoscope, then you need to know these three zones. I, I, I don't know how many of you use the endoscope. The endoscope could be helpful if you're doing a foraminal disc and far lateral disc, it would be less traumatic. That's the only time we use the endoscope. Most of the time we're doing it uh, microscopically. So same picture again. So if, if this is three, four, this is L3 narrow root. This is the medial part of thecal sac and L4 narrow root. And that's the superior end plate of the inferior vertebra. And that's the lower pedicle. And that's the triangle you'll be working. If you're working for the uh, paracentral disc, paracentral disc will be uh, compressing the L4 narrow root rather than L3. Framinal disc will be compressing L3 narrow root. And then as the disc comes out, your incision can be uh, more paralateral. So two to three millimeters, okay for paramedian. Then you go up to a, uh, between five millimeter to centimeter as the fragment goes out. So it's very important to know this anatomy. And this zone, central zone, paracentral zone, framinal zone, extra framinal zone. Now, this is another thing which is very important in the overall patient management and discectomy. And I'll show you why on the anatomical basis. The reason you get leg pain from lumbar disc prolapse is it can cause direct compression it can cause inflammation and it can cause stretching of the nerve root or nerve root tension. And this is where most of the failed back syndro syndrome comes, not realizing the, the nerve root is stretched. And there are two things which can stretch is one is if the disc height is reduced, the pedicle can tent the nerve and you'll have to drill the uh, pedicle to increase the height of the foramen. Or the other thing which can do it is the superior article for, uh, articular facets of the inferior vertebra. So if you don't address that, but just doing discectomy is not gonna make the patient better. It's very, very important. The series I've done it, I'll, I'll show you a few hand made pictures to explain. You. So McNabb actually wrote in 1971, the causes of nerve root tension other than simple disc herniation. So he said the foraminal disc, because if you're not see, seeing the scan properly, you'll miss it. And particular thinking can to the disc height loss. As the disc height reduces, if you have a chunky pedicle and it's statish, it can compress the nerve root. I'll show you in the pictures. Then foraminal impingement by articular process, as I said, it's usually the superior articular facet of the inferior vertebra. Then addressing the lateral recess stenosis, if at the same time has a lateral recess stenosis, and then extra foraminal disc herniation. If there's far lateral disc, if you're not seeing the scan carefully, you'll miss it. And remember, it's the upper nerve root which giving the trouble in foraminal, extra foraminal, and the far lateral disc herniation. So if you at, you're working at L45, if you only decompress L5 nerve root, none of these patients is gonna get better. It's the upper nerve root which needs decompression. So should, going back to that picture again. So if you see here, the speed, as this, the nerve coming out of the foramen, if the superior articular facet of the inferior vertebra is 
going towards the foramen, it will kink the nerve on it like that, like that. So, uh, so remember again your boundaries of the lateral recess, foraminal boundaries. I'm going to ask you this question in the end. You can read the boundaries of the lateral recess and the foramen, which I can read for you. So the lateral recess is a space defined medially by the edge of the thecal sac here, and laterally by the medial pedicular plane of the level of the mid vertebral level. So if it is L34, so it's the mid vertebral level here and the upper vertebral level of the lower vertebra. So this is all your lateral recess. And this is your foramen. And the foramen, as I said before, is between the two particles. And to deal with this, I repeat again, your incision should be above the disc space when you're lab labeling the labeling the incision, otherwise you struggle during whole operation. And if you're dealing with pathology here, your incision will be below the disc space. If you're dealing with central canal stenosis, it'll be 50% above, 50% below. Otherwise it's one third, two third. So I'm, I'm deliberately repeating these things again so that you remember. So these are the handmade pictures from the Mac, uh, to explain you the McNair root tensioning. So, uh, foraminal hernia, we can now easily identify on the MRI scan. I think in 1971, they were finding it difficult, they're doing it. The foraminal impingement of superior facet uh, uh, process. So this is, if you see here, uh, number, uh, uh, sorry, number two is the particular kinking. If you see here, the nerve root, we should be coming straight out like that. When the disc height is reduced, and if the upper pedicle is quite chunky, it can dig into the nerve. And I've published a couple of uh, times, you can miss it. And you won't get good result. You will be seeing a small bulging disc, you remove that. But if you haven't drilled this part of the facet to open the foramen, the nerve will keep kinked. So, in, so look at carefully in patient where disc height is reduced and the nerve is kinked, it's, could be because of that if the pressure is from the top. The other problem which can be, which is the number th third situation is that the nerve can be kinked from the bottom. So, so uh, what happens is it's coming straight, but if the superior article facet of inferior vertebra is chunky, it will displace the nerve above like that. So this one pushes it down, that one pushes the nerve above like this. So you have to trim the superior articular facet of the inferior vertebra. So th these anatomical variation uh, and this anatomy is very, very important to study, especially in older patients with disc prolapse. You need to study this very carefully before deciding your dis uh, surgery and extent of resection. The other thing you should be aware of it is that uh, you need to differentiate between the radicular pain and claudication pain and instability catch. So this was again uh, described in literature very early that instability can present as leg giving way suddenly when patient is trying to stand and walk or upright. And you, the other parameters are given, but the only reason I put this slide here is that in, in even 1970s, McNabb reported this, that if you, are trying to stand from sitting position and it catches you and you can at time collapse, it could be an indirect sign of the instability rather than the radicular pain and the pressure. And surgical approaches, we all know that. I won't go into that, we all are aware. So I'll go back to my picture again. So once you have studied the scans, so it's very important now, now we know that not only the prolapse disc can give you trouble, is the uh, uh, reduced height of foramen and especially the chunky pedicle, if at that level is, will kink the nerve inferiorly or the superior articular facet can kink the nerve superiorly. Or if you have a lateral recess narrowing or central canal stenosis, then both nerves can be involved, the uh, uh, exited and exiting nerves. So you need to decide very early, are you don't, gonna do just a microscopic, very clean operation not taking any bone, just between the two lamina, just doing the ligamentum phlebectomy and remove the disc. And most of the time is a very satisfying operation and you come out. But remember at times you will have to do the foraminatomy to drill the upper facet 
at times you'll have to drill the superior articular facet to free the nerve. So this is a nerve. If the pedicle is pinching on here, or if the superior articular facet is pinching here, the lower pedicle usually doesn't compress the nerve. So then you have to free, drill all this area, all this area apart from doing the discectomy. And then if you, uh, for the lateral recess, you have, which we, we said is the space between the medial part of the medial border of the thecal sac and the both pedicles, and you'll have to do just very small decompression in this area. And if it is full blown canal stenosis on top of disc prolapse, then you'll have to do complete decompression. And skin in scene, I've told you, you need to decide very early whether it'll be central, paramedian, lateral, posterior lateral, and usually, as I said, about two to three centimeters enough. And then you need to decide it should be centered on the disc space. That's only in central disc collapse. If it is uh, postulateral, it is two thirds below, one third above. And if it is foraminal and extra foraminal, it is one third below, two third above. And if it is far lateral, it's all above the disc space. And if it is uh, articular process, it's all below the disc space. Otherwise, as I said, you'll struggle during whole operation. So it's very important to remember these anatomical points. So Jad, depending sorry, whether you're running out of time, I'm just. Okay. I apologize. So I think I'll just uh, stop here. Uh, just show them how the approach differs in the endoscopic. This, as I said, we are only using it in foraminal and the uh, uh, far lateral disc. Otherwise, if you don't understand the anatomy, you'll end up having failed back syndrome. And I'll just skip all this. I just want to show you, you need to understand if as if uh, the foraminal disc, if coming from outside, you drilling from the outside, little bit of isthmus and facet joint. If you're coming from the interlaminal approach, you can do this in uh, upper lamina, lower lamina, you can up and into the foramen there. And you, whatever you do, you have to keep at least five millimeter of isthmus at the pars. And a, a typical entrapment I've shown you is could be from the upper fa uh, uh, superior facet or from the chunky pedicle. And it's amazing that a lot of people don't uh, 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 take that into consideration. But I want to show you my last picture. So I'll, this one. So nerve can be compressed at the level above. As I showed you at L4-5, it can, if the, uh, uh, where the nerve is originating, L4 can be compressed there. Then it's the discal level, it will compress, the, the nerve can be compressed at the discal level. Then in the lateral recess, under the pedicle, this is the pedicle, can cause the pressure. Then it's the foramen and the superior articular facet. So you need to remember these five zones of the nerve, three story concept and three zone on the axial views. And it's very important, otherwise, you can't get every patient better by one sing single operation of discectomy. So I think I'll stop here. And I would like if somebody wants to take, especially the central disc prolapse, what will be your approach and how yes. much exposure you will Amjad, need. can you show yourself? I'm sorry, uh, okay. otherwise we'll run out of time. Uh, okay, that's fine. I'll just take this away. So you, you just tell us why you do and what. Or should I just talk through, yeah? Yeah, just talk through it. Uh, okay. Oh, no, you need to. Okay, go on. You, you can tell us about the uh, five different approaches. Where would you do? So I think from the trainee and junior point of view, uh, the way I've seen the tra uh, my trainee struggling is like in a large central prolapse disc, they're trying to do it with a 1.5 centimeter in CN and they're trying to do it through interlaminar approach. And it, you can't do that. You can actually cause more damage to the patient and you can convert the partial cardioquina into full-blown cardioquina. You need a wider exposure in central disc prolapse and it depends on your experience. The experienced surgeon still can do it from one side, but from training point of view, I will recommend you to do a wider decompression, which I showed you on my previous picture. So you need from right to left, from upper uh, lamina to the lower lamina. For postural lateral disc prolapse I shown you, that, that's the most standard operation you do is you just fashion your incision about one third above the disc face, two third below, and you can give central incision and uh, you can take it most of the time without doing any bony decompression. Then the third patient I was showing you was the, with, the, with the lateral recess narrowing. In that patient, again, you'll have to do a bit of uh, trimming of the lamina. Most of the time it's the upper lamina 
and uh, just the border of the inferior lamina be more than enough. If you just do discectomy and don't do the bony decompression, lateral recess will remain narrow. And usually you'll keep getting the pain from the upper nerve. And then the foramen I've shown you, if there's a foraminal disc prolapse, I, I've showed the picture. There are two ways of doing is one from inside. You do the drilling of the upper and lower lamina. It's only a few millimeters, two to three millimeters upper, and then you do the inferior, and then you enter into the foramen and remove it. Or you come from the outside, you have to drill a little bit of the pass, but you have to keep minimum five millimeter, and you have to do the speeder, uh, drill the speeder articular process, then you remove the disc and, and enlarge the foramen. And then the far lateral or the extra foraminal disc endoscopic approach is the, uh, the least traumatic approach to remove that, but you can do through the microscope also. All right. Okay, that, that was brilliant. I apologize. We just ran, ran out of time. I think what we are not going to be looking at the MCQs as well. I'm sure people have solved it. For those who have obviously solved it, we are going to be, um, yes, I, I know that you're missing the analysis, but unfortunately not enough time left. Uh, we just took too much time on the first lecture. It was great. I think Amjad, your talk is great. What we need to do is we need to do this in about 15 days or in a week's time, showing us few cases and going through yeah. why in every case what you do. And you know maybe you can show that with those five cases of yours and then explain in detail again. And uh, we can do those cases uh, separately and decide what needs doing. Uh, you can send questions uh, uh, to us uh, on our email address, which you all have or on the WhatsApp group, and we can collect those questions and send that to Amja, then he can have them ready for uh, your answers the next time you come. I apologize, we just ran out of time. So our Professor next, Salman, can uh, we have a couple of questions? We have a couple of questions. From I know, people. but I think, no, there's not, in the, sorry, uh, it's uh, okay. Maghrib prayer. So I just, I, there's not that much time left. I apologize. So this okay. is, uh, this is because the first lecture went on for, it was a brilliant lecture, but uh, it went for an hour. Um, okay. On Wednesday, um, we have uh, Professor Roger Hartle from Cornell, and we have uh, Maurizio Farnari from uh, uh, Milan, uh, Italy. And both are going to be talking about future of spine surgery, anterior and posterior deformity of C spine. And our two moderators are going to be Paulo Pereira from Portugal and Azam from US. Uh, and can we go the next? Can you show us the next poster, please? Uh, Imad, are you there? Can you show us the next poster? Okay. And then you have Rotown Neuronatural Course. That's okay. Uh, then Module 3. And Module 3, we are, we'll be doing Surgical Anatomy of Cranial Nerves 1 to 6. Actually, it's 1 to 5. It's not 6. Um, uh, and Miguel Orez uh, and Pablo Gonzalez, both the Spanish friends of ours, are going to be um, taking us through. We have Hassan Sayyid, Azam, and Chandrasekhar Pujari joining us for this. And it will be a wonderful treat. You know, all are most welcome to go through this. Our second session of the module is going to be after a week. Uh, then we have um, uh, Ramesh Nair, who's going to be, sorry, go back to Ramesh Nair. Uh, Ramesh Nair, can you go back, please? And um, that, uh, that one is on 4th July. That's, uh, okay, so you showed the wrong one. I apologize. So this, so keep going if it's if it's that long away. Can, Can you show the, the next one? Yeah, yeah. but for July we don't yeah. need to see now, please. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's twenty. Okay, so it's twenty second June. We have uh, two friends from Korea, so we have a Korean field day in which we have uh, Hyun Sung Kim talking about transforminal disc and uh, how to remove them and tricks uh, for that. And um, Kang Lim, who specializes in atypical forms of endoscopic spine surgery, is going to be talking about multifunctional role of endoscopy in spine surgery. We have Oscar Elvis. Oscar is with C, not with K. Can you please correct that? And Nicolai Peev uh, is there from Belfast. So these are our friends who will be moderating this session. So it'd be wonderful if all you all can join on the 22nd that we have. Uh, on Thursday, we have uh, two sessions. Uh, we have one of uh, the WFNS Spine Committee, a deformity session that's at five o'clock and seven o'clock. We have Roger Hartle and uh, Maurizio joining us at uh, seven o'clock. So it'd be wonderful. And thanks, thanks a lot. And uh, sorry, there's not enough time, but we will do this discussion with cases. Nadim, we'll do that. 
I'm sorry, Nadim, we could not have any input from you in the pre-traffic thing, but you know, hopefully yeah. we can have you. Actually, earlier. I had some Just emergency, think... so yeah. I can understand. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So, so thank you, everybody. It's a pleasure having you all. And sorry that uh, we could not take questions, but we will try to do this uh, next time for you. Okay. Bye bye. Thanks, Omar. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Amjad. Wonderful talk. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.